Okay, this morning we're going to interview my cousin, Richard Higgins. Richard, nice to have you here. Nice to be here, yeah. Uh, tell me when and where were you born? Well, I was born in 1917 and uh, in Indianapolis. I don't know the address. It was a home rather than a hospital where I was born. Oh, uh-huh. But uh, that was, I had two older brothers. What was the, uh, what was the date in uh, 1970? Uh -huh. You need the real date? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, October 27th, uh -huh. 1917. Okay, good. Um, and you had, uh, would you say you had two brothers? Two older brothers, you know. Gene, and the oldest brother, and Bill was the next oldest. Gene was nine years older than I am, and Bill was six years older. Then I had, of course, my sister Alma came along in 1924. And uh, that was the total of the children we had, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh -huh. um, okay, Alma was born in 1924. 1924, then. I don't remember uh -huh. the date, or any of them actually, the date, per se. Yeah. Now, Alma, um, okay, now that's not Alma Jane. Yes. Well, okay, Alma Jane. <coughs> yeah, Alma Jane. Okay, I got gotcha. you. With yeah. my sister. Yeah, okay, I didn't realize he was that old. Um, and what did your dad do? Well, he was in the, worked as a glass factory. Uh, he started when he was 13 years old in those days. And uh, they made uh, milk bottles and street lamp uh, bulbs and uh, all types of things of that nature. And his job didn't sound too technical in a way, but he was very good in his work. And the article written about him, but he would take the glass from the furnace and put it into the molds to make the things, and uh, there was, it took a lot of skill to do it, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, what was his what name? Was, what was his Patrick. Name? Uh, don't yeah. ask me his middle name. <laughs> Phineas. Oh, Phineas. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of an Irish name. Isn't yeah, it? <laughs> Patrick Phineas Higgins. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so Higgins is an Irish name then? Right. Do you, uh, your relatives, have you followed back where they came from and stuff? No. Uh, Alma tried once. He went over to Ireland, and but we never had too much success in running them down. Of course, my mother was German. But, yeah. And so it was a mixture there. Now, where was your dad born? Was your dad born in Indianapolis? He's in Ohio, but uh, I'm not sure of the town that he was born in. Moonville, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah. guessing a bit there. Yeah. And your mom, what was her maiden name? Your mother? Uh, Frida. Her first name was Frida. What Frida was it? Frida Rushmeyer. Yeah, Rushmeyer. Okay. And, and she, she was, where was she born? She was born in Evansville, yep, yeah. Indiana. Right. Uh, and um, uh, and what did her uh, parents do? Her dad do? Well, that was of course Fred. He was the police department there in uh, Evansville. Yeah. Came over from Germany. Well, he came from Germany himself. Directly, yeah, uh -huh. and. Uh, he had been a tailor at one time. They always said he was the best dressed officer on the Evansville Police Force. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but uh, that's the top. Yeah. And, and Bill Rushmeyer, how was he related? Well, he was related to my friend, my grandfather. I don't know whether they were cousins uh -huh. or some of that nature, I think. Yeah. But they were related. Right. I think my dad. Seems like he said that Bill came over because they were conscripting the young men to go into the army and stuff like that. Yeah, he didn't I want any part of it. Story. And that's that's I know one my grandfather uh, sponsored him. Uh huh. But in those days, I guess that was quite common the way to do it. Right. But he uh, he brought him over. Yeah. But he was a what? Uh, no, he was a captain. Uh, Cabinet maker. I yeah, I think so. His uh, uh, training background. Right, yeah. So back in Indianapolis, um, <coughs> how long did you live there? A very short time for me. When we, when my family moved out to uh, California, I was two years old the next day. Oh. So <laughs> it was, say, I was 17, I was about 19. Yeah. 1919. I came out here to California, been here, of course, ever since. You were mentioning, though, that 
was your dad and, and relatives were interested in the in, in auto racing and went to the very street. much so. You know, Indianapolis. Uh, they say my first street car ride. My dad took me to Indianapolis track uh, <laughs> to watch some practice. I guess. Oh, wow, and, that's, uh, so that would have been like 1917, 1918, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the track there. was, I think, 1911 was the first when it was built mm -hmm. or when the first. So it hadn't been there very long then. Huh? Yeah, that would have to be fairly soon. Then the continue to follow racing out here because I think most of the back in those days the drivers for Indianapolis were from the California yeah. race uh, circuitry. Or, uh, yeah, I think yeah, a lot of them came from here. Uh, it was a very popular sport. <laughs> so did your dad come out here for a job uh, to California? Is that why you all came out? I think it was more that uh, he had some brothers that had come out here prior to him. Mm. and. Uh, because he was aware of them and what their the conditions and everything, and uh, yeah. it just apparently it turned out to be a good time for them to make a move, so they came out. Where did they move to, or where did you move to when you first came here? <laughs> That's kind of interesting. If you're familiar with Los Angeles, there's Wilshire Boulevard and all that. Mm -hmm. But we lived on a house, with two families of the Higginses, on uh, what was Wilshire now was Orange Street in those days. Oh. And uh, it was practically downtown L.A. Yeah. where we lived. <laughs> it's where the freeway goes through there now. But anyway, that's where uh, we moved to. Is there on Orange Street? Uh -huh. And uh, what was it? What was it? Was it just mostly homes and things like that there then? Or yes, mostly homes. Across the street from us was the Rex Hotel. And that was before Hollywood was well known. And uh, a lot of the stars and so forth at that time lived in the Rex Hotel across oh, really? the street from us. Oh, really? And uh, then later on, of course, Hollywood got more popular why they moved out of there, but that hotel was... A, Do you remember seeing any of them or remember any of them? I was were there? too young to really be that aware of them, I guess, to you know, get down to that. Was your dad working in the glass factory out here too? Yes, you know, he spent his whole life uh, doing that, working in the glass factory. Where was it? Down in Vernon little community there in southeast Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. There was a glass factory. And uh, then as he got older, why well, he went into being maintenance and taking care of the equipment, doing that more than he was, uh, which was more physical than what he had been doing. So during the Depression, he always had a job, pretty much? Well, I guess typical, a lot of people, when they'd get an order, they'd call you in and he'd work. Oh, yeah. And then uh, there'd be maybe off two or three uh, weeks or a month and then come back and work a few weeks and then that's when fortunately uh, Social Security came into the act so when he'd work he'd build up and get uh, some pay when he wasn't working you know that, how that worked and so that was a big boon to us being the fact that even when he wasn't working he was able to draw on Social Security and then with the, the brothers all this uh, doing odd jobs and different things while we contributed to the family to keep things going. But the, the prices and things in those days uh, sound ridiculous today. I, my paper route right <laughs> uh, about $3 a week for what I was handling. And of course, I turned that over to my mother. Uh -huh. And then she'd give us money to go to a matinee or something on the weekend and something like that. But that meant a lot to keep the family going, just that small amount of money, which today sounds ridiculous. But uh, we what, all contributed part time that way. Uh, what grade school did you go to? Grammar school. Uh, I went to uh, well, St. Agnes, which is you know what location? That was of course in Los Angeles, and then from there I moved over to um, well. The name of the junior. I went one, one one year to a junior high public school, and then uh -huh. I moved over to Poly High, where I, oh, yeah. I wrapped up my high school education there at Poly High, yeah. which was one of the old time schools in Los you Angeles. You said there weren't but a couple. Uh, at that time, yeah, LA High was the first school in LA, and then uh, public school, and then the uh, Poly was the next one. Yeah, and I think you said that uh, a lot of the uh, Hollywood kids would nominally 
uh, graduate from there, although they might not have got, spent well, less time was, there. That was more of my wife, uh -huh. Beverly School, where she was out in West L.A., which oh, was yeah, fairly right. close to Hollywood. Uh -huh. Un the University High uh -huh. was used by the movie people to give them diplomas, you know. Did you play any sports in school? <clears throat> no. They um, didn't have sports like we have today. Uh, tennis was the game I loved, and uh, there wasn't any tennis teams and anything like that. Uh, Bill Tilden? There was no baseball. Was Bill Tilden playing in those days? Oh, yeah. yeah he was Tilden really good. Was a big one. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course, I, I don't know if Jack Kramer was. I know he was from out here in L.A., I think. I don't know if he was playing around at that Gonzales. time. Gonzalez. Yeah. was a name that you don't hear much, but he was one of my did heroes. You, did you see any of these guys playing uh, out in LA? No, I was getting back now, you're talking about too, with radio, there was no TV. Right. So we listened to it on the radio, some of these uh -huh. but there wasn't that much sports even on radio. It was uh, yeah. some reading about it. My brothers, of course, were all interested in sports. And we had uh, the Angels and the Hollywood Stars, which is a Right. A, a league that was Pacific below the Coast League, Coast yeah. league which mm -hmm. I thought really it was a it was more fun and top quality players that were either on the way up or on the way back from the majors and uh, so we spent uh, my brother would take me out to uh, baseball games and the Angels was our team in, in those days. Where did they play? Where, where was this the park? Uh, it was in. In Los Angeles at that time. Uh, did they play at the same Street? place the Hollywood Stars played, no, no. or did they each have their own? Uh, each had their own uh, places. Then uh, my brothers would take, and my, especially my brother Bill, he was interested in racing. And uh, we had an Ascot racetrack, which yeah. was uh, very famous back in those days. And uh, we'd where, go out where, to Ascot where, where all was the time. It? Where was it? it was in kind of the north part of Los Angeles. It's not there anymore. Oh, no, no. Well, that's been gone for quite a while. Then later on, they came up with another Ascot, which was the south in the town, but it was never in league with the, the original big Ascot uh, track for drawing top uh, drivers. We went to uh, racing out the Beverly Hills track, which a lot of people don't even know even existed. But that was where Wilshire and uh, Santa Monica Boulevards cross in, in Beverly Hills, and it was a big one. It had the uh, vertical banks, they could go wide open oh. and never have to ease up. Yeah. And we spent a lot of time going out to that track. So I spent a lot of time around racing. It was interesting to me. What uh, what other interests did you have when you were in high school? Well, art was my big thing, of course. That was, uh, my brothers were in artists and animated cartoon field, which was just starting up. and. Uh, yeah, t tell me about that. Where where were they? In Hollywood, you mean? Or what? Yeah, it was out in Hollywood, but the studios were nobody was knowing about them at that time. The field was just starting, so to speak, and then there was little studios would come up and work, and they might last for a few years or a couple of years, and then they would fade away. And uh, so would they be doing cartoons and things oh, yeah, like that? Oh, animated time? cartoons. Yeah. yeah, this was long before Disney, huh. and uh, so. I was just raised in the family with artists all the time. That's all I knew and thought much about was art. In those days, we used to do a lot of things on our own. You know, kids would have to develop their own. We'd get baseball teams up and go play in a lot somewhere and uh, play tennis. And uh, there wasn't any organized, like, little leagues and things right. we had today. That's not the way I was too, bro. Um, did the... Um uh, did your, were your mom and dad artistically inclined too? Not that I'm aware of. I don't know where it came from. The fact that three of his brothers all <laughs> yeah. took to it, but uh, not that I'm aware of that uh, there is any. Yeah. So uh, when you grad, what, what year did you graduate then from? Uh, Thirty-six. 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 So then, what did you do after that? Well, that's when. Uh, Things were still tough. There wasn't many, anything to, in the art field to get into. I went around a couple of places and tried to get it, but they all said I needed more training and more that I got in high school and that sort of thing. So then it was just, uh, I say, depression was still on. We needed money. I had a scholarship in art. To, I turned that down in order to get a job to get some money into the family. And so 
I was telling about going out and going down the street and looking for parking lots with good cars, and then I'd go in there and try to get a job. I figured they paid more. <laughs> but uh, then I, through a friend of my mother's there, I I got called in the, for a job in electrical making high voltage power circuit breakers, which was strictly utility type of thing. Uh, and uh, worked my way up through there until I retired. You know. Okay. Um, where was that? Uh, where was that company? Or that was on North Main Street in North Los Angeles, just north of the downtown area. Right. Short ways. Yeah. And uh, so you you started there, what 37? Thirty seven. Okay. So four years later now, uh, December seventh, nineteen forty one. Do you remember what you were doing that day? <laughs> yeah, it was on a Sunday. Yes, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, my wife's mother was Christian Science, and she kept trying to tell me, you know, they want me to go to church with her and the Christian Science Church and all that. So finally, I weakened, and on <laughs> December the seventh, I went to <laughs> church with her, and uh, we drove home and we pulled into the driveway with uh, my Bev and the, her mother and myself. I, Everybody came rushing out and saying Pearl Harbor had been attacked. So it so might, might have been your fault, right? I said, that, that, that's enough religion for me if, <laughs> I, if I'm going to create something like that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, okay, so you, but you're married by then, huh? Wendy Emerson? No. Oh, okay, well, we, how, okay, well, uh, well that uh, was a neighbor. That's where we met. She oh, was a couple of doors up from me. Then the kids were out there. We weren't kids particularly, but we still go out and play baseball in the street, <laughs> different things, different yeah. age groups. And uh, so I, she was just a gal down the street that was very pleasant and nice and had fun. She was going out with other fellows and I was going out with other girls. And if we didn't have anything to do, we'd go out together. And uh, we just went about seven years, mm -hmm. uh, just as good friends, you might say. Yeah. And that's how I got started. Now you were telling me or that when you each were I don't know, I guess two years old or something like that. In Indianapolis, you were at the same, was it a parade or something? That's like? what she tells me, yeah. I was on her side of the family. Yes. Yeah, apparently, I was talking to the family. I mean, there was a big parade back there in Indianapolis, and apparently she attended it, and my folks were there too. So we <laughs> went to the same parade. And we were just yeah. youngsters. So when did you get engaged then? Uh, well, we were going to get married in, in 43, and I was still working. Of course, the war was going on, but because of my work, I hadn't gone in. But uh, that must have been a couple of years before that we got engaged. You were telling me, and I don't know, maybe this was when you were going together, how you would go to the Hollywood Bowl and how it was then, how it's different now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell me about that. Well, yeah, that's a, it's a shame, I say, now what they... Uh, what they lack in what they could do in those days. And uh, the shell was on uh, like a railroad track, wheels, and they could roll it in place or they could push it back behind a hill so you couldn't see it. And they could put on the shows like Aida and uh, what was the other one? I was telling the other day that singing uh, In oh. the Love Call. Oh, uh, yeah, where they, uh, uh, Nelson Eddy. Nelson Eddy, and then they show where they'd have speakers on each side of the hills, they'd sing back and forth the Indian Love Call, and which they can't do today. And they had, like, and the hills was all open, they had guys on horseback, red coats and different things all riding around, and it was just a whole stage at that time. And then they finally made it permanent, they couldn't do that, but I think it's, L.A. lost something in the, uh, having a place where they could put shows like that on, but that was exciting. Yeah, it was. That. So when you went out on dates in those days, what would be a typical date? What kind of things would you guys do? Well, we were fortunate. We had a uh, big band here, uh, and they had the Palladium, which was a beautiful big new uh, dance and eating place. There. It still goes, I guess, a special thing now. And we went to all the top, uh, like the Andrews Sisters, uh, there was a several of, the, of these places that put on the dinners and shows and all that. Yeah. And uh, we would go back to that. We'd go to like, like music. They had bars where they had these twin piano players. 
you go in there, there's mirrors on the wall and up on the ceiling, and you could sit around, and, and these fellows would play the piano. You could watch them while they're at it. Yeah. And they had a circuit. There was a group of them that go around, and there was this one bar out on Fairfax Boulevard that we liked so well. It was close for us, so we'd go out there a lot of time, not drink so much, but the music was so great. Yeah. Uh, did that, of course, go into motion pictures. We went to plays. There was a lot, a lot of things to do. Then I think, gosh, with people like the, you know, Sammy K and the, all the top uh, bands we, we yeah. went to. What was the first? Did you have a car then? And what was your first yeah. automobile? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, back during the Depression. I was still in high school and couldn't afford a whole lot. And the garage fire, fire over behind us, and had a '26 Chevrolet Roadster in there and. Uh, it burned down with the garage, and I don't know why. My dad was a good sport. We had to drag it home. We got it for two dollars and fifty cents. They had fifty cents for registration, and two dollars I paid the people for the car. And we had to kick the wheels and what have you to turn them. Everything was burned up. All the woodwork. And I spent two years rewiring it and building all the, everything up on it. And uh, that was the first car. And uh, but you finally got it running. Oh yeah, yeah. It was probably used that to go to the beach all the time. It was uh -huh. great, uh, good mileage. It was meant a lot in those days. We paid about twenty some cents a gallon. But did you ever surf in those days? Did oh yeah, surf? really? Oh, With yeah. the long boards and stuff? No, no. now you're going. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no such thing as a long board. It was uh, body surfing. Oh, you went body surfing. Yeah, uh -huh. we body surfing. Oh, yeah. and, uh, Which beach did you go, like to go to? Well, Manhattan. We we liked the best. Uh, group I was with, the kids, uh, lots of waves and good size, it rolled for a long distance. Is that fairly close to LAX now, Manhattan Not Beach? too far. Yeah, it's right in the line there with Huntington Beach right. and uh, Redondo and we're all down the line, one after another. But uh, yeah, we had to do our body surfing, you know, which was uh, a skill in itself in those days. Then uh, they came in from Hawaii with these first uh, longboard, as you call them, right. but they were constructed like an airplane wing. Oh. You know, they're all in, they were hollow, and then they had all kinds of structure in between the support, and then oh. they had a veneer skin, and they would be maybe four or five inches deep, oh. and they would be, what, ten feet tall, and average kids in those days, we couldn't afford one of those, but they, they came in from Hawaii with that. Well, the other thing we'd use once in a while was, I don't know what they call them now, but we'd get, get a piece of wood and, and uh, maybe four feet long, we'd round the front end of it up and then they'd concave the back would fit around our stomachs. And we could throw that down in front of us, uh, yeah. and like a surfboard. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, they have, so they, they have a, kind they, of there's another name for classic, them Classic uh, surf riders or something like that, yeah. yeah. But we did make our own, yeah. uh, those things, that uh, they'd pick up a wave. Did and, you have uh, flippers? Your feet. No, no. <laughs> no, I never heard of flippers. Yeah. You know, I can remember the first time I put one some flippers on, and I tell you, it takes strong legs because of the resistance of the flipper. Mm -hmm. And I'd go to kick my legs. I wouldn't long. I, they were tired, you know, in comparison to just swimming straight. Right. Yeah. So, what was the second car you had then? Well, the second was an Oakland. They don't make any more. Oakland Roadster. Then I had a 29 model A Ford coupe, which is a good little car. And then from then, list up the line, the Plymouth with floating power, they called it. The motor was all hung and it swing and take all the vibration off of the body. Really? And it was smooth. You know, it was a four cylinder uh, car. I don't know how up well, the line you want to go. Well, let's go up till, till you went into the services. Well, then that next one was the Willys American, they called it, which was the start of the Jeep. Jeep oh, engine, yeah. actually. Yeah, with the Willys American in that. And uh, that had features that, that I wish they had today, which uh, it had um, free wheeling, they called it. And they finally said there was no, they couldn't have it because uh, the engine had played no part in slowing the car down. Oh. It would uh, be, it'd go to coast mode. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah. You'd start out in low gear, and then you would uh, go to second. You never had to use the clutch again. You could oh. shift to second, to third, 
right. to fourth without ever touching the clutch. The only time he touched the clutch is when he came to a stop. Mm -hmm. And the, the amount of gears you could get, it had an overdrive on it, which was the first time I was aware of an overdrive. And you could put the overdrive in in 20 some about 25 miles an hour. So you go up to 25 in second gear, and then you could let up on the throttle and go into overdrive in second. That gave you a gear between second and third. And like going up the mountains, you climb and you know, you, you could pick up a third gear, you go into overdrive, and uh, you had all kinds of varieties of gears you could use. Huh. And uh, it would cruise at 70 with no problem at all. It was a, it was a great automobile, and that's the one I had when I went into the service. That was a Willys American? With American, you know. Huh. It was a good little car. I, I wish they had some of those features today. Yeah. <laughs> So how is it then uh, you went into the service? Uh, how was I went oh, uh, into it? Yeah, I mean, what what was the circumstances? For that? You're still working. Well, you're working for. Uh, that, but this time I was working in engineering as a design draftsman, and the big push at that time, of course, was the expansion of these major companies like Edison, not Edison, but Boeing and uh, but Douglas. You were telling me, I think. What kind of got you a foothold in up the ladder a little bit was uh, a guy you worked for that liked tennis and stuff? Oh, yeah. yeah. They say you never know what's going to help you down the line. And I uh, say I have a lover of playing uh, of tennis. And uh, the superintendent of the plants, he, he was a big tennis fan and played a lot of tennis. And so we had these picnics and things, and we'd have a tournament, and then we'd have the finals at the picnic, and uh, usually it ended up the superintendent and myself in the finals, and uh, we got a good friendship going up. He was an older person, of course, and uh, so one day the drafting department needed uh, somebody to hire somebody for the job, and, and uh, he went to back for him without me even knowing it, he, to the head draftsman, and uh, told him to give me, you know, give me a chance to do it. He, I guess, knew we'd talked about stuff, and uh, so he had to argue with the guy. He said, "Oh, Higgins, he, he's an artist. He's not a draftsman, and that sort of thing." But finally, he, he prevailed on the, to hire me from the job I was in the plant already, and so I got into the drafting department, and that was a big move for me as far as moving up the ladder was concerned, getting into the drafting area. And, uh, so then I went to a lot of night schools and I had the things in art class he didn't get, especially mathematics and things of that nature. Yeah. I had to start going to night schools and picking up the subjects that would help me in my work. So uh, going back kind of into high school and stuff, <coughs> the art, you were more freehand kind of stuff. I mean, that you did. Yes, it uh -huh. was a more of a hobby because uh -huh. you couldn't get a job. Right. And, and what, did, what did you like to draw? I mean, like when you were in high school and before you had this job, let's say. Well, I was strong on racing cars, airplanes. <laughs> I did a lot of drawing of that sort of thing. Um, I loved nature, and I liked uh, drawing scenes, pretty scenes. Uh, that would be, say, mountains, deserts, anything that had to do with that. Yeah. Uh, did you ever come out here to Palm Springs when you were living in, when you were a kid, or uh, before you? Did more of that, I would say, after the war. Bev and I, we like to take. She liked to travel as much as I did, and we'd jump in the car and take off for a day or a couple of days. And Palm Springs was really a quaint uh, little village in those days. Yes. Uh, there was a few dignitaries coming down. That was even before the flood of Hollywood stars came in here. It was just uh, just a very nice place to come in the winter. We didn't. Couldn't take the heat in the summer, yeah. but, but we did love to come down here in the winter. Do you uh, do you still have some of those sketches and things that you did when you were in high school, of those race cars and airplanes and things? No, unfortunately, uh, I don't have any any of those things. Uh, they weren't the type of thing that you'd hang on the wall particularly. I just liked the looks yeah. of some of the cars yeah. we had when Ralph De Palma and and, and Mayor. Uh, Driving and uh, Sam Hanks and a lot of the you would see the pictures in uh, magazines, magazines and things like that newspapers yeah yeah and uh, 
So I love the draw, and I still think they got a lot more character to them than they have today, line-wise. And you went out to Minesfield from time to time? Oh, which yeah. Is the old, which is now, well, which became LAX? Mainly uh, the air shows, that type mm -hmm. of thing. They held them out there at Minesfield. And, uh, we went out there. My dad was a great one for race cars, of course. He liked airplanes. And uh, we'd go out there to the, to the air show. And that's the big thing in that front. You were telling me about one air show that you, there was a, a German fighter. This was before oh, yeah. the war. Yeah, that was the biggie. Yeah. Well, there was a lot of things happened uh, in that particular show. I think it was prior to the war. And... Uh, in fact, it was Hoop Gibson, who uh, was a big cowboy right. star. Mm -hmm. He was quite a pilot. Yeah, that's right. And he uh, he flew in the races out there, watching Hoop Gibson fly. And, uh, and I think I was telling you one day there that the Army had the three Musketeers and the Navy had the three Seahawks, which was similar to our uh, top t teams that the Army and Navy had today, the Blue yeah. Angels and them. And they were three three made up a team, each one of them, and the uh, leader of the army team, he flew in the races also, and he ended up getting killed out there at the, towards the beginning of the show, I guess, air show, So then uh, they brought to our surprise to lead the musketeers, they brought in Lindbergh, yeah. and which I always thought of, I say, more as a pilot that flew across the Atlantic and a few things, never thought of him much as a military pilot, but he, he led that crack team uh, in their maneuvers at, at that air show, particular air show, which was quite exciting to watch, to watch him and doing that, and uh, that's what I was talking about, the Navy team was so good that they tied their planes together and they took off together and went through all their maneuvers together and then came down still tied together. It was exciting and then that's when this race went on they had this uh, German plane sent over from Germany and uh, I don't know what it was it was one of the planes that eventually was became a war plane because it was just prior to the war yeah. and uh, that thing was so fast that it, it just lapped our planes at that time it was and uh, as I recall why the pilot that one was uh, goring when he was before he became so well known that he was flying that German plane. Talking about Lindbergh, I believe this is correct, that when, when the Army uh, sent those uh, P-38s to shoot down Yamamoto in the Pacific, and it was a, they had a long way to go and, and, and to intersect where the Japanese planes would be, mm -hmm. was real problematical, but uh, they had Lindbergh help them uh, figure out, you know, the time and the distance time and all that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so he, he was involved with that. the war. Uh, well, he uh, he went to over in Europe, of course, a lot of his time, I guess, prior to the war even. And I remember he gave a number of warnings uh, when he came back of what Germany was up to. He better Yeah, watch. right. I, a lot of people thought that he was kind of saying, kind of, you know, that... Uh, we, you know, we don't have a chance against or whatever, but as I, I've read that he was, uh, and that he was kind of friendly with Germany. But yeah. from what I understand, he was kind of a spy for the United States, and that was kind of a pose, so he could get in and see the stuff that they had. He was real nice to them, and so that they would I let him do that. that. So. I knew that he had come back and told them over here what, the, what Germany was up, up to, to, what right. their capabilities were, and... Uh, yeah. We should be aware of it. That, uh, 1932, we were talking about the uh, uh, the Olympics that they had uh, in L.A. Did you ever go to them? I took one in the gymnastics. Did, uh, did you? I went to the gymnastics with oh, that yeah. one. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. My brothers. You know. and, uh, but also in 1932, there was another event, the earthquake. Yeah, that was the, that was the biggie of all the earthquakes we've had. Tell now. me about that and what you were doing and stuff. Well, that was, uh, we were sitting was towards the evening, and we were sitting, I remember, on the front porch of the family, we did so much then, and uh, all of a sudden this thing hit, and uh, I can remember those telegraph poles were just swinging something fierce, the, the power lines were snapping and cracking, and uh, 
you couldn't stand up. It was uh, it really was a, a rough one. But you had, but, you uh, had experienced earthquakes before, but not, oh, not, not. I wasn't even aware of earthquakes oh, prior to by that. By that time, you didn't no, even know it. Mm -hmm. Because they, they were, they were a little bit didn't register that right. much to me. Yeah. But that one was something else again. That uh, the neighbor across the street got pinned against the garage door. Uh, he was between the garage and the car, and the car rolled against him and pushed him into the wow. garage door. Uh, then. All that Huntington Park, uh, it was almost in ruins, the bricks and stuff, they had a lot in those days. Uh, it was all across the streets. And people were going down everywhere trying to help uh, these places that got hit, which was, uh, say, more damage in the south part of L.A., but then in those days that was the area that was built up more. And uh, it just went on and on. That was one of the bad parts about it. We had so many after shakes and they were they were not little ones they were really nerve-wracking they really hit so you were afraid to go in the house but that was a and did you say you close the schools down did you ride your bicycle somewhere or something <laughs> yeah yeah i had oh, this happening? old racing bike i had yeah i got some nervous sitting around waiting these things coming that what's, a, what's a race what's a what was a racing bike like in those days well it had the little thin wheels and the light frame but uh, there was no speeds. There was no like today with the ten speeds and even three speeds at that time. At least I wasn't aware of them. That there might have been, but I had never run into them. Mine was just a straight racing bike, and uh, you know, that's when I we lived over by USC then, and I and I drove out to my folks' house out by UCLA in West LA, which is about twenty some miles, and uh, just to ease attention, I was just nervous and I got on that and I just rode all the way out there and then my dad's brother whose uncle he said I better let my folks know where I was they, they didn't, I had never even told them I was going I didn't know where I was going and uh, so they called and so I turned around then and drove another rode that back another 20 or some miles back <laughs> with very little time in between the turnaround so I did about 40 some miles <laughs> that night during the quake. Just to, but as I was riding along, I could hear it. Oh, it I couldn't feel it on the everything. bike, but uh, I could hear the aftershocks as I was riding. So it was a. Today we have aftershocks or something, but usually peter down, you don't notice them hardly. But that one was, uh, was a rough one. It was hard on schools. They went for years there without uh, a lot of facilities. The buildings were condemned. They had they brought in. Uh, tents and the temporary type of structures in the athletic fields and all that so they could put schools and Polly had a beautiful auditorium and uh, fortunately for some reason it uh, went through in good shape so a lot of the high schools in that time would come in there for their graduations and we're talking you know, a year or two after this, they hadn't been able to reconstruct these places so it, it affected the schools and all that for quite a while I spent a lot of time in temporary schoolhouses. You know, so that was quite an experience. So, um, did you get drafted then to, when you went to the nineteen when you went to the service? Yeah, I was. Uh, well, they, I got draft notices for some period of time, but because of the work that we were doing, they had to build these factories up, uh, Douglas and all these big steel companies. And, Kaiser and all these, and that they needed my work, what I was doing, the design drafting work. Uh, and they said, oh, no, no, the company didn't want me to go, and they went to bat and said, you know, we can't go. And so they went along with that for until 1943. And uh, then we had caught up. They were, the the workload wasn't there. We'd already done the job of building the stuff up, so then I was available, and so then I. I went in at that time and the draft notice came up. So that was in 19, July of 1943. The wife and I had planned on, we were engaged then, I was planning on getting married in 43 and instead of that I ended up in the Army. <laughs> and where did you go for your basic training? Camp Roberts up in the central part of California. Mm -hmm. uh, up by San Luis Obispo, up in that area, right in the middle of summer, hot. It was terrible. 
just to your hands and doing obstacle courses and different things. But that's where I got my basic there, and an artillery, uh, had infantry and artillery uh, basic training. And uh, I had been studying TV field at that time in night school. It was sounded like something was going to be good. There wasn't much TV then. And uh, so when I got into the military, well, they, they had that down on my record, so they moved me into the radio end of the uh, training. So I was always in radio uh, part of the Army. Yeah. That period of my life. You know. And then where did you go from Camp Roberts? Well, once I got out of there, um, one of the big schools for the artillery is at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And they had a radio school there for the artillery. And so they moved me then back to uh, Oklahoma to Fort Sill and continue training in the uh, radio end of the things. So while I was there, that's when the Army decided they needed more pilots. <laughs> I can tell you about They put a notice out, so I had always wanted to fly. I was interested in aviation. So I applied and uh, they sent me down to Biloxi, Mississippi, Mississippi, yeah. and uh, that's where they had a lot of the training programs for the Army Air Force. So they would run you through a series of tests to see whether you qualify for a like, pilot, navigator, or bombardier, and uh, they ran you through a series of tests there. So I went through that, and uh, and after that they. You can continue on to the yeah, sequence. Yeah. Why uh, then went out to uh, Big Spring, Texas, and they had what they call online training, and that was a field where they were training bombardier uh, bombers, uh, pilots for bombardiers, and all that sort of thing. And uh, so I was there for a few months, going through that training. And you, you, that's where you did some flying then. Did didn't get a chance to fly, but I get the, I got to the point where we'd go out and pre-flight the planes uh, uh, with some pilots going to take off. Well, we had these Lockheed Electrons that the, they were using for the bombing training, and uh, their twin engine. Same thing with the Earhart uh, flew, actually. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. And uh, so I got to the point where you go in there and start the engines up, and uh, that was fun as a kid, and sit yeah. in the pilot seats and all that sort of thing. And uh, well, they went through all kinds of stuff, from parachute to packing. Uh, well, that was basically what we did there. And then after that, I, I never could figure it out. They, they moved me to a college in Ohio, uh, Breckett, no. I can't remember the name of it now, the college there in Ohio. But we had uh, went through book learning and book oh, stuff. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I was only there for a few weeks. Didn't get too deeply into it. I was looking for there, but after you'd gone through the course, at the end, why you got to fly there, Piper Cups, oh, okay. and you get your license as a pilot. For, you know, and I was looking forward to doing that. Well, and prior to getting that far along, why they decided they had too many pilots. They didn't need them. You had said that you had been up in the Stearman a couple of times. Where, oh, yeah. where was that? Well, that was uh, before the war. Oh, oh. That I, my brother's friend was a top-notch pilot. I was telling about, and uh, he was out at Cloverfield, which is the uh, Douglas Air Douglas plant out in the west end of town that was known as Cloverfield, and he flew planes out of there, and he used to fly a lot of senator, different ones around places. He was pretty well known for that. But uh, so I got him talking to him to take me up. And this, so he had a steerman there. He had different ways he could fly. And the old biplane opened. Right. So I got to go up in that, and he took me up in that. That was a real big thrill. Oh, I, I must have been in must have been about sixth or seventh grade there, I guess. So I was about 14, I guess, some of that area. And uh, he took me up and ran, flew me around and did, played around. He didn't do any loops and stuff, but he did a lot of playing around. So that was a big, big thrill, yeah. That, uh, 
So when they said they didn't need any more pilots, then what'd they do with you then? <laughs> <laughs> they had a bunch of sick guys on their hands. Everybody was too sick. They like they said it's the infantry. <laughs> and we're going through the line of the doctor checking us out and everybody had some complaint and problem why he couldn't fit in the infantry. <laughs> he still railroaded us through. So we ended up going from the Air Force, which was very deluxe. The food was better. Uh, everywhere we went, people were marching, they were singing and doing all that, and well, the infantry you didn't sing, <laughs> you just marched. And uh, so uh, we ended up at uh, Camp Breckenridge there in Kentucky, and uh, they were forming the 75th Division at that time. So we were, and again, this radio still cropped up, uh, we ended up with this INR Intelligence Reconnaissance, uh, part of the regiment, the 280th Regiment reported to the regimental commander and uh, I was a radio operator in the INR so I had the radio but now I was carrying them on my back or on my in my hands or something like that specialized in patrol work um, and I Breckenridge is near Owensboro, Kentucky, I right. believe, which is yeah. probably, what, 60 or 70 miles from Evansville, maybe? It was about 50 miles, about 50 I think miles. it was, yeah. yeah. No. Uh, and Bev, well, now, were you married by this yeah. time? Yeah. Yeah, I had, uh, first you we weren't going to get married, I was going into service, and then when uh, I figured, what the hell, $10,000 worth of insurance, and we were very close <laughs> anyway, yes, so and uh, I figured, well, she might as well have the 10,000 thing happen to me or not. So we went ahead and changed our thinking, and I, we got, got married. I uh, had a pass, and came home, and uh, she, she was working, and her mother and I ran around and made all the arrangements <laughs> and all that. Uh, Where were you stationed at that time when you were at Breckenridge? Oh, you were at Breckenridge. Yeah. Okay. So honeymoon was turning around and driving back to Breckenridge. <laughs> Fortunately, we had a lot of good relations back there. My mother but, okay, sister, you got married in Evansville or in, no, in, in married California? married here in California. In California. Yeah, right. it was a, I always laugh, it was a combination funeral home and, a, and it had a chapel where they oh, married okay. people. So I said, we got married and had a, a funeral in the next room waiting to come in after we got <laughs> married. <laughs> but uh, all our friends, everybody, of course, was gone. I didn't, we didn't have... Uh, Everybody I knew was in the military. And Beth, of course, had girlfriends and things that where she worked. They made up most of the congregation. So it was a, a very simple thing. I was in uniform at the time. My brother Gene, who flew clipper ships and things down the Pacific, he got time off and managed to fly in to be at the funeral, or a funeral <laughs> at, the, at the wedding. Yeah. And my brother Bill, he was working for MGM in the cartoons the MGM was making at that time. So uh, he was in uniform and he, so I had both my brothers in uniform uh, were, were there for the wedding, which was nice. Uh, was Alma Jane there too? Yes, yeah, Alma was there. But uh, like my brother Bill and the cartoon things, well, the military stepped in and uh, they needed films for training pro programs for the military. Oh, yeah. And so they just took the whole unit over and made them uh, soldiers. And no basic, they never put them through anything at all. They just made them soldiers, and then yeah. they had to start drawing. So it, it's kind of odd for him in a case like that. These films were pretty well paid. And all of a sudden, he was getting, what, $50 a week as a military guy. Next to him was his friend who hadn't been brought into this program. And he's making all this big money, and my brother's doing the same thing and getting paid hardly anything for it. <laughs> so you drove back to Breckenridge then to, after you got married? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a... Uh, and then where did, Bev, where did Bev stay? Well, she stayed with Mitch. Uh, Who was? <laughs> <laughs> well, related to how you, how you tie them all down. Uh, yeah, your and Alma, of course, was uh, living at home. That that with was Grandpa. Your, yeah, okay, your so it was, okay. It was related more through Uncle. Uh, I think okay. Let's see. Your mother's sister 
was Alma. That was an Alma. Mm -hmm. And she was li she had married Thompson. Zed Thompson. Zed Thompson, right. And, and they were living with uh, they, Zed's they, son they, Earl her, and his her, wife Midge. Right. And was was your was your grandfather staying there with them too? Or, or I mean, was well, Alma? Yeah, your Alma was living home with Grandpa. Oh, she was not living with them. No, she was living she at, was her, living at her grandpa. Taking yeah. care of her dad. Mr. Richmeyer, yeah. the, the policeman. Yeah, she was taking right. care of him. You know. so okay. And, and, uh, so was, was, was Zed, was, was Zed with, living with her and, and the grandpa that? Zed. Well, he was living there at home uh, with, uh, Midge and, uh, Midge and Earl. And Earl. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that so Bev stayed there Bev on, stayed, on Reed Street. Yeah, she and Mitch hit it off real well. Okay. You know, they, we lived there on yeah, Reed Street, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and you would go get time off to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was writing my own passes every night. You know, how, how coming you, coming home from. How were you getting? How were you able to do that? Well, I had my car. That American. Uh, yeah. Well, no, American, I mean, how did I you get the passes all the time? Well, I got to be good good buddies with the clerk, <laughs> and that's a good thing to always do. He knows what's going on, and so he gave me a book of blank passes so I could go home. And so I'd write just a fake pass up, get in the car and take off. Then Midge and my wife would, uh, in the morning, would drive me back so I'd get back to camp before they had their revelry, <laughs> which had to be kind of early so they wouldn't know I had, cause they would spot it pretty fast if I wasn't there. Right. And uh, so then that, that was a routine, which was a pretty rough one to maintain, because that went on for several months, uh, going through that routine. Just about every day? Yeah, or, uh, every, every night, day. Or yeah, I don't think I already missed. And then if I had KP duty and stuff like that, I, I would hire somebody to take my place so I could go home. You know. Did you still <laughs> have that Willie's uh, car? Oh, no. No, that was kind of a sad deal in a sense. I, I then I, I, well, again knowing the clerk, he told me the the, cup, the division was scheduled to pull out to go to Europe, and it'd be about two weeks, uh, a little longer than that. But anyway, before they start the packing and doing that, so he said, "You got some time coming. I have 30 days uh, time." He says. I'll write you a pass and you get the hell out of here. <laughs> so he did. So I called Bev up and, and told her, let's go pack up. And uh, so we got in the Willies then and drove back across oh, to Los California. Angeles. Uh -huh. Yeah. With, uh, then that's why I left the car there. And we had a mechanic I had dealt with for a long time. I told him the situation. I wanted her to take the car and he'd keep it going. Well, it fell apart. He didn't do a very good job time I eventually got back home again, the car wasn't running. It was, had gone kaput there, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but that's, uh, I had that Willie's all during that time. Uh -huh. so you were driving, that's what you were driving back and forth. Yeah, Evansville. Yeah, Evansville, <laughs> yeah, with tires that were C rations. I think they had to be racing tires that were reclaimed rubber. Oh, yeah. And you, you didn't get too good a mileage out of them. But, but Did Bev work in Evansville? Any? No. No, she had worked so she the only she was company. only there for what, however long you were at yeah. Bradley, right? so mm -hmm. it was a few months there that we were there before we, we pulled out. So when did you when did you go overseas then? Uh, it was in forty four, I guess it was there that we pulled out and went over. You were on a troop ship? Oh well, yeah, yeah, a convoy. It was I understand one of the largest convoys at that time was two divisions of us went over it was five rows of ships and it was a it was a big convoy. Did you get seasick? Yeah. Oh god, yeah, yeah. I, I've got my card at Homer into once a couple of times where you had to get your ticket punch when you got to eat. <laughs> it was half half used only, but but it wasn't for cheeses. I think I don't know how I made it. I lived on cheeses. They seemed to do the job. But that was terrible there because we were down in the hole of the ship, the USS Brazil. We used to run South America to New York at that time. <coughs> it was a good size, one, but we were below the water line, and they had bunks stacked up about seven high, and you couldn't lay on your side because the guys 
above you with the hitch you had to lay on your back or your stomach in order to get room in there yeah. and uh, smell was terrible you, you, you could go to the bathroom area and uh, you could smoke in there so all the people in those days smoked a lot and uh, between being sick and smoking and all that it, it made nothing to make you sick just to go in the place uh -huh. yeah so where did you uh, where did you land over there then? um Swansea in Wales, and we came in and landed, and uh, then they put us on a train and took us down to Fourth Call, which was sort of a resort town in, in Wales, and they had moved an awful lot of children and people, older or whatever, uh, out of London when it was getting bombed and all that, and then they sent them to places like Fourth Call. They were full of because there was nothing there for anybody to bomb, particularly. So that uh, we ended up in uh, in Port Call. Now, were you still a radio operator? Yeah, I was a radio operator the whole time in the oh, army. Yeah. But uh, nothing fancy about it. Uh, in Oklahoma, there we had to learn to work the key, which I managed to do to make it, but I wasn't ever too good at it. But uh, did you do any of it in Morse code, or was yeah, it all it Morse code? Go, but did you do any basically voice? Basically, my, my work was voice. Yeah. But uh, in Oklahoma, what have you, you had to learn how to use the, the key. Did you, did you have any Indians? I mean, you see the movies; they have these Indians. They do it so that uh, they don't, the Germans don't, uh, can't listen in on it. You know, they, the Indians would, yeah. would do their they, Indian language. Did I you heard have any that, of those? Yeah. Did you, did you ever see anybody no, doing we, that? No, no, no. <laughs> we had. Uh, a machine there that did the coding, oh. which uh, we had we had about four squads, and each one had a radio operator. I was in one, and then they had the the head guy, our mm -hmm. uh, captain. He's the one that had the 50 caliber machine gun and oh, yeah, <laughs> all right. his cheap, and he had the the big radio with the key set up. That he had a sergeant who was the head of the, our radio group. And he was always in the jeep with the captain, and he had this big rig uh, in that. And uh, but the rest of us was depending on the type of the patrol we were on. We either carried one in our hand, or we had it strapped on our. Back. Was it like with a, a walkie-talkie kind of yeah. a thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the it was, range? It was it? FM. And uh, the problem was there were so many things that got in the road. That any FM uh, won't go. Over a hill, it won't go around a hill like AM. You, you, you can communicate better because of the nature of the thing. Well, why was it FM rather than AM? I don't know. Everything was FM in the uh, in the service that uh, they used. Um, so you had to get up on a high point or something. Well, we could communicate, but if I wanted to talk to uh, somebody who was on the other side of a hill, like you had to move to get where you could get around it. Otherwise, you You'd be blocked by that hill. And what would be the range if you didn't have anything in your way? Well, our case, I would say we were never more than four or five miles away from where we were communicating with. How far it would go, I, I don't know. Yeah, but it was we, we, we were able to cover. You know, now, did you, did you do voice in code or, or, no, or just just the just straight voice? Straight voice. Yeah. But we had certain rules if. You couldn't get through. Why? You didn't want to keep talking because mm -hmm. they could zero in on you. Uh, the Germans would pick up the, the sound, and then they could map why they could pinpoint where you were. And you would have they you would have a code like dog one or something like that. Somebody no, that you're calling. Or, no, how would you? I mean, how would you know who you were calling? And, and they would know that you're calling them. Or would each each outfit had their own radio guy. Or how? I mean, how? If you were going to call somebody, you don't just dial the number and. No, you just get on and call. That we had code names, and you'd uh -huh. call your code. Like headquarters would have a certain code, and just get on and call that code, and then they, they would come back and answer you. Oh, okay. That's, and that's then, what and then you yeah. start your phone. Yeah. Plain discussion. We never tried to camouflage anything, particularly there. Uh -huh. um, we didn't use the phones all that much, the radios all that much of what we did. We'd go out and do our job, say we had to go up 
find out where the Germans were, they'd retreated and have to find out. Well, there was no conversation involved there. You give yourself that way. Right, yeah. So then you come back, then you gave a report. So most of our communication was actually yeah. reports when we got back. Yeah, you t I think you told me that it, it ended up becoming more clandestine, kind of a, uh, going out at night or sometime or somewhere and trying to find out where the Germans were rather than well, get into a We were the fight. eyes and ears of the regimental right. commander. and. Uh, then any time he went anywhere, we were his bodyguards, so to speak. Uh, like I know at one time, we, the commander of one of the companies was killed, and our colonel had to go out and take over that until they could get a replacement. So we got in our two jeeps of us, and we went down as his, kind of his bodyguard in that case. And uh, we got stopped by our own fellows from here on into this little village area we're going. He says, that's all in a direct observation of the German. He said, you got to space yourself. <clears throat> so we'd take off racing like hell, and then another, another guy would go. <clears throat> then we pulled into town, and uh, the ambulance up ahead, I remember, had been hit by artillery fire, and uh, they were under, there was a couple of tanks in, hiding behind buildings there, the guys all buttoned down. And then we pulled in, and uh, two of us, and uh, well, fortunately, we didn't add enough. We knew sound, and we heard the shell coming. We dove out of it, the shell landed in the middle of the jeep and blew our jeep up. Wow. <laughs> but we were on the ground, so we were below the shell when it yeah. exploded. Huh. We lost our jeep there, so we all ended up in one jeep. But the commander, but that's where we'd take these types of things where he'd go in and do something or had to be involved. We'd get involved in that. Where, where was that, where that happened, where you lost your jeep? <sighs> you know. I don't know. See, I don't, when you're in that situation there, you're not in big towns. We're out in Tunis and places. Were you Europe in Europe. Belgium or Germany? Or no. to, uh, maybe we should back up a little bit. Okay, you're in Wales mm -hmm. and <laughs> waiting for orders to where you go or, or what? There, well, we didn't know what at all. Rumors, basically, in those times, we were going to be police. You know, and the ship had a bunch of white helmets in it, and all these rumors people would start. So we didn't know one th day or the next what, how long we were going to be there. The war was kind of slowing down because this was before the bulge and things would look like there was going to be a, a nothing home, to it. Home, home it was, yeah, Christmas, we go going right down, yeah, that type of thing. So we just lived day by day not knowing what to expect. And then that's when the bulge breakthrough came like, right away. They, they and you tell, were telling me there was a little mix-up between your outfit and another one. Yeah, that was the, let's say we the luck of the draw or something that in that convoy it was made up of the 106th division and our 75th and uh, we got to Swansea and in the fourth call well, we waited we never got mail and this is what upset us we were by mail meant so much to the, yeah. guy, the GIs and they were raising hell and that's so they told us well the reason for this problem is that they, they swapped us in the convoy our destinations and Instead of us going over to the continent, why we went to Swansea, Wales, and the 106 went to the continent. And uh, so this was, I say, before the bulge started. So 106, I don't know how many miles, it, one division was stretched out something fierce. They should never have done it. And they were untrained and combat at all or anything. And the Germans, of course, I guess knew this. So when they made their big break in the Bulge battle, why it, they took the 106 as their route, and they, it was only a matter of gosh, hardly a day. I think they went through that whole division. There was no resistance at all. They just captured everybody and equipment and all that. Yeah. So that was fortunate for our case. It was, <laughs> I was sitting back in Wales, <laughs> nice and safe, and the, where I could have been the other way around. Yeah. So. But when that did happen, then they called you guys up. Real right fast. This is a matter of a couple of days we were in our way. You know, they convoyed so, across the, uh, England over to... Uh, in trucks? In, in trucks, uh -huh. yeah. Took us over. Uh, I don't even know what port it was there. But we took off from there across the channel and up, right. the, up the Roar River and unloaded us up there. When you got to there, that was was the battle battle still going on, or was well, it just started? Oh, yeah, oh. we 
it. It's only been a couple, a few days. We were there fast. They yeah. threw us in. And I guess but the weather was real bad initially. That's it. That was the uh, bad part. You know, yeah. what made it bad too was the fact that our division made headlines. And the whole my mother and them had a, were really upset because we didn't have time to get clothing. We just had our regular army, what you see, you know, and yeah. overcoat and that sort of thing. That was it. And uh, they threw us in over there. We lost half of our division just to cold frostbite, frostbite and all that. You know, we, like put your overcoat on and you button it up and then you almost break when you open it up. It was so frozen. Your overcoat and stuff was that cold. And there we go go to get a hot meal or you go there and the cook and cook up stuff and you know, when you get your metal pan you go get it and, and you put the stuff in it. You go go and sit down and start to eat and it was frozen in the pan. Now when you <laughs> when you're there do you know what's going on? Do you know that the uh, Germans have made this big breakthrough, and, or is it just they sent us here and now we're here? Or, I mean, did you have any idea no. of the overall picture? No, this is the bad part. Like you know, you say, where were you? Well, we didn't. We don't have any maps in our level of, of personnel in our job, so we don't know what's happening. It, there's no uh, no one's communicating or telling you. You just go here, do this and that, and what have you, and do your job. And uh, no, we didn't know where, where we were. And it, of course, at that time, they were still advancing when we got into it. It was Christmas of uh, 44 when we went into combat, Christmas Eve. And uh, that was kind of interesting in a sense there that the guys still wanted to have a Christmas tree. And uh, when the Allies would come in to bomb or something like that, uh, they'd drop tinsel down. I don't know if you were that or not, but they'd fly over and drop all this tinsel down. To and jam the Germans radio. Jam the Germans radio right. up. They couldn't uh, mm -hmm. fire back. And this was, when the first started out, the, uh, the weather wasn't quite that bad. Uh, we still had air cover for a few days. But then after that, that's when the fog and stuff came in. And we had no air cover at all. It was purely ground fighting without the air support. And that hurt uh, more than anything else, but we had superiority in the air. All right, exactly. Did you, did the guys use that tinsel then to decorate? Well, that's what I was going to get to. Yeah, we ran around through the woods, picked it up tinsel, and uh, we decorated our tree with all this tinsel that it would drop from the airplanes, you know. So, what was, I mean, what was your first day of combat like? I mean, do you remember? Were you being shot at and you shooting at other people, or, or what well, was your feeling about it? And, and, or did no, you that really was, did uh, we ended up in, uh, it was out in the Thule's, I, I, I remember, and this is where uh, I was telling you about being put on the duty there, as a guard duty for the, the unit. You know, we walked down the road, and I was there at nighttime. And uh, I heard these guys coming down, walking and talking. I knew and I challenged them. It turned out to be a, a group of our uh, tank guys that, that destroyed their tanks and had to fight their way through the Germans. And they were coming and gotten back. And uh, so the guy gave me this Thompson submachine gun. He, he was through as far as he was concerned. But that was a... We just sat there. We didn't know where the hell we were. We didn't know what was going on. And then we had, uh, this is our first night, so I'm thinking about it. And uh, we got word that there was some guy came in with a uh, armored vehicle. It wasn't a tank. It was one of these kind of a chain or a tractor type of construction and all. And this captain was in there, and he was trying to get to a, a unit down this road. And uh, so they, they pulled two of us jeeps out and said, okay, you, you take him down. We didn't know where we were. And we had a map. This was Hue, I think, H-U-E, little town. And so we're going down there. There's trees on both sides of us. And we went down, this guy behind us. And uh, all of a sudden, here comes a, a, one of our tanks sitting there all on fire. And uh, person, this guy was behind. He had been in combat for a while. He, was, well, he got all excited. He said, get the hell out of here. And so we were 
we were right into the town, and there was a circle, and we spun around, and we went wide open, right, right back down this road. The next day, why the Germans were on one side of the road, the Americans were on the other side, we went right down between them, and they didn't fire, because they didn't want to give themselves away. Oh. <laughs> and there was a hell of a battle there the next day, but we went right wow. down between them, back out again, without getting shot at. And that was my first uh, day in the combat. And then the other thing that was that I always remember was uh, going up a road right at about a block from where we were, just out in the country. Like, and here was all these dead Germans, and see the first dead person. You know, nobody paid attention to them, just laying there around all over the place. You know, and uh, that's quite a shock to see your first person that was dead. Did you develop real good friendships with any of the guys in your unit and stuff? Not too much in the sense that it lasted after the war. There was ones that we kind of buddied together. We had yeah. a lot in common with. Them. Did you lose any good friends when you were? Oh, yeah, oh. yeah. You know, we lost quite a few. How, how what, what was, uh, like the first time that happened, what, what was that feeling like? And then did you finally get used? I don't know if I should well, say used to it, but I mean, accept it. It, uh, I don't know, everything is so tense, you know, in that, like, uh, it happens away from you. Like, we had one Jeep uh, with our fellows in it that uh, turned around in a road, and the English had been there before us, and they supposedly cleaned the area out of bombs, and they backed up close to this post, and there was a, there was a mine there, and it blew the Jeep up and killed them. And so I, I never saw them. It was done away from us, and so that they all of a sudden they were gone. That was, you know, it wasn't some close type of thing. Uh, closest they came to something like that was one time we were supposed to go up to this little village on top of a hill. It was supposed to be under our control, and we'd go up there and leave our jeeps, and then we were supposed to infiltrate through the Germans and go back. And there were some bridges and things. We, they wanted to know if they were still intact, and we were going up there and then on a patrol, go through the German lines and get back. So we were going down the hill, and then we could see the village up above. And as we got down to the village, we were, our jeep was about the third jeep in line, I guess. And uh, the information was wrong. It was still held by the Germans. And they had mined this whole area. And there was an American sentry just before that was on the side, and he didn't stop us. He got court-martialed, I understand, but that. But I remember going down there, and all of a sudden, our first jeep hit the minefields. And when I'm sitting back here, I can see bodies going through the air and pieces of the jeep, and everything was just flying all over the place. So that, that's a, a shock to see. But uh, that was the closest I came to seeing yeah. something in that sense. Then we had uh, another one got hit with a shell in the back of his head. Of course, he was a mess. But I didn't get sent out to. To, uh, to I don't know if I had to send somebody out, but I wasn't when they sent out. Yeah. So there was a lot of, I say, I lost a lot of good buddies, so to speak. Uh, the other one time I we were out where we were, wanted to know if there's canals all over the place, and they wanted to know the regiment whether or not this bridge had been knocked out or whether we could go over and use it or stuff. So they sent us out in the nighttime, and the Germans were supposed to be on one side of the canal and we, on the other, so we parked the jeeps back and we walked and we got down and we started you know, crawling and stuff to get up without being seen. And uh, our captain, in fact, was the one I was telling you about, he said, I wish I had a hole. <laughs> yeah. He was, uh, uh, he hit his foot hit a mine. It was, it was personnel mines he oh, had man. all along there and it blew his foot off. And uh, another chap and I and our medic, we had a medic with us all the time. Uh, yeah, we picked him up and carried him and got him in the jeep real fast. We got him to a like a, a mash out there. There wouldn't be any mashing right. there later. We got him there real fast. But the next day he was dead. We never could understand because our medic was there. We shot him with you know, painkillers and we had him there so fast. But here a person just lost a foot and very little blood. And yet he was dead the next day. So our medic was really upset. I had a number of you know, people, people I was close to, but I never kept any friendships up after the war was over. Yeah. We got broken up anyway. Right. 
yeah, tell me again about when he was looking for a, a hole. What, uh, what, what was the circumstance of that? <laughs> well, yeah, that was kind of a thing. Like the other job we did a lot was observation work, and so we were set out at this wooded area, and there was this little town just offside, with farm buildings around, and we were supposed to report back to the Germans what they were doing. And one of the things you're taught when you're doing this kind of work is you don't use your imagination. You tell exactly what you see. Because you might say they're evacuating, and you know, they're not evacuating, but you might get that information. So all you just tell about the movement. So we're reporting back to regiment what was going on in this village. And, uh, and we were supposed to be, certainly at the time, then we were pulled out. And you saw Germans down in the village? Well, yeah, there was a farmhouse not too far below us, then the village was a little farther back, and that's where we were later watching these Germans in this farmhouse, and uh, they were walking around, they had no idea we were there. And then this one character, he's back to one that got hit in the back of the head later on, was killed. <laughs> but uh, he was kind of gung-ho type, young kid. Also, you know, I was a grandpa of the family. And uh, as we pulled out, he hauled off and shot one of these Germans that was out walking around this place. And uh, that gave us away real fast. They knew we were, somebody was up in that woods. So then they laid down a barrage on us, and uh, we had moved, fortunately, away from the heavy part of it. But they were still hitting trees and what have you. And when one of them was coming, you could hear these things coming, and we hit the ground. And, I had a depression there. I, I managed to fall in this depression about high level deep. And uh, that's when the sergeant, in fact, this is the one that lost his foot and died later, he, uh, he dove right beside me, and I'm only a couple of feet apart, and he looking me in the eye, and we're laying there, and so he said, geez, I wish I had a hole. <laughs> it was just a little gully is all I had, but he would have given anything to be in that gully, I guess, at that time. You know? yeah. Those were German 88s, probably, that were firing on you, their artillery? It could be. They used them so much for everything that uh, yeah, we had a lot of respect for that 88 gun. That thing was something fierce. Um, and so on the Jeeps, when you guys went, you had what? You would have how many guys in a Jeep? Three. Three in a Jeep. Radio operator, I was in the back. We had a rifleman in the front, front and then the driver. We're all were trained. <laughs> it didn't make a what, lot what of What kind of uh, uh, firearm did you carry or did you have? Yeah, we, all, you know, we had, uh, oh. as a radio operator, because of the equipment and stuff, I carried a carbine. Okay, that's and kind of a short rifle. It's a, a, yeah, it'd be like a 22 almost in size, except there was a 38 uh, caliber, but it was not very big. And it was it automatic, was, was it? Or, well, I mean, it wasn't automatic. automatic. It was fast. You could pull the trigger. You could shoot. You, you uh, could right. make a machine gun out of it. But, yeah. Although they did. They. But you didn't have to inject it. You no. just you had a clip no, and just, it, just, and just you pulled just the kept trigger. Firing, yeah. yeah, and then we would take two clips and reverse. We had 15, I think, in oh. one, and then we'd tape another to that. So we'd have 30. We'd all you had to do was pull it out, turn it around, and send it back in if you had to. And that, but it was a smart move. They said that. They found out that the average person couldn't shoot a revolver with a hoop. You know, the people who used to carry revolvers. So they came up and gave them carbines, and everybody could shoot a 22 almost. So we were all pretty good with the, with the carbine, but we couldn't hit the broad side of the barn if we shot a pistol. Did you have occasion to use your carbine? <clears throat> no, <clears throat> I never had to use it. In fact, I had one bullet that got to be my good luck piece. Every time I'd go out, any time, I'd shove that one bullet in the chamber. <laughs> and then when I'd come back, well, I'd take it out and keep it. And so I finally gave it to my grandson. I uh, opened it up, took the powder out, and I gave it to him as a good yeah. luck piece. But in our work, uh, if we got seen or got shot at, we weren't, we were not supposed to. We weren't, uh, that wasn't our business. So I wonder, we never, did you ever, um, you would get, like you get an order, okay, he wants you to go behind the German line, do all this stuff, and then come back. Did you think, why in the world are they sending us on this foolhardy mission kind of a thing? Or did you just do whatever they said, or in the back of your mind? Well, you we think? knew that, you know, they told us what we had to do, go find them, and we'd crawl along. We'd end up getting to where we could hear them talking, say. Oh, really? It didn't like, be like two or three in the morning, it'd be black as hell. And, and uh, then, then 
we'd work our way down. We'd have a route we were going to take. There was a little hill, say, down here. We'd go down to here, to, we ran into them in the woods. We have an idea where they were because like, the terrain was a natural. And then when we hear them or find them, well, then we would follow along until we go up to the hill, see if anybody was on the hill, because we give them a, a good spot. Then we'd check that hill out if there was anybody on it, and then we'd come back and we'd report them that where they were and the hill was clean and it was all right. And do that sort of thing. But we were given those instructions where to go, so we knew that, what we were trying to do. Yeah. But uh, locally, it was during that stopping the Germans and all that, like, Gosh, if we if we went 50 yards in a week, you know, and the, the thing people don't realize, I think, so much is the the number of people involved in the, in support. You got a company with 200 people in it, say, and then behind them you got all the trucks and the supplies, and which makes it. But those few people up there, some of those companies, I would say, during that period I'm talking about, they were completely replaced two or three times in a week. They were getting killed that fast. You know, it's a, so it was, a, you know, it was just a hell of a lot of people killed in small quantities and small little groups. You know, the the uh, people behind the scene, they weren't getting killed. But the guys going into those companies, that's a, boy, you gotta take your hat off to them, boy. They were, they were something else. Let's, uh, Let's put the map up here. I know it's not that good of a map, but we can maybe tell a little bit about it. I'm just going to set it up here. You can just you can just stand up here if you want to. Okay. And let me give you. I'll let you do the little pointer, maybe, and kind of uh, well, kind of like this. And uh, let me uh, put my camera up on it. Can you kind of point to about what we're talking about here? Well, we started out and landed over here in Wales. Yeah. And uh, then we convoyed across, picked up our ship when we went over and across the channel and hit the Roar River. There's the river here, went up. And most of our work was all done up here in the, uh, the rural area, the Black Forest. Yeah. <laughs> we were in that forest all the time. That was you see any cuckoo, cuckoo clocks when you were there? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's interesting, the trees looked like they'd been planted. They'd been there so long, they can rose. Oh, yeah. Instead of being a haphazard forest type uh -huh. of thing. And uh, most of our fighting and things we did was away from the cities. They weren't into any major cities. We didn't go door to door or do that type of thing. And then uh, when the Germans got stopped, so to speak, yeah. in the bulge, they opened up a new front down just north of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. That's what I was writing down there. I kind of thought about it was Colmar. Oh, Colmar, yeah. And uh, so they pulled us out in some other divisions, and we ran us down across the French Alps, which was quite pretty, but it was freezing cold. And we went down, and we got in this Colmar yeah. uh, phase of the, the war. Tell me, then yeah. we went back up into the, the rural area again. Tell me about when you uh, captured uh, Dusseldorf, or show me where that would be about on the map. Well, that was on the outskirts of, uh, of the industrial area, the Dortmund. Oh, okay. Go but, ahead, uh, you can have a seat now. I'll, uh, I'll get back in and then you can tell me about uh, back up here. You're so limited, you know. I, I say we only moved uh, a mile or so. It was a big movement there at that particular time before we, the Germans right. began to actually retreat. Yeah. But uh, we just sat in one place almost. It seemed like there was. Uh, it was uh, part of our job was was uh, it sent us out to find out who we had been fighting, and we we have to go oh. out and go through the Germans. And go through their clothing the and, dead and, ones, and, you mean? yeah, uh -huh. and, and find out what any identification and stuff we, oh. that they had. 
and so it's been a lot of time frisking dead Germans, and uh, it. Uh, Not too appetizing, been, huh? No, but he got out. Oh, didn't mean anything after a while. I don't know. Right. I was fortunate that when most of the ones I saw were already dead. I mean, to yeah. see somebody wounded and yelling and crying and screaming, like you do in an actual combat scene, but um, we saw them. Like, usually, in that part they were they were dead or they were. We were observing them live ones, you know, but we never actually got into right. into that. Although, well, I'd say one time there, they sent us out. We were going to have a big advance in our companies and stuff, and the regiment attached us to one of these just as observers, and we followed up to see how fast they were moving, where they were moving, and how how good things were going. And I can remember that one time there was a a light tank of ours came out of the, over here, say, out of the woods into an open clearing, and our tanks were back here, and the German tanks were over here, and this poor guy came out, and our tanks and the German tanks didn't recognize this fast enough or something, and they all clobbered this poor little tank, <laughs> really wiped it out. It was all part of this movement we were making when they, they did that. But it, uh, Tell me about capturing du Dusseldorf. Well, yeah, that's when uh, we were sent out. I don't know what the you know, what the mission was particularly. We had a, a new captain took over, and he wasn't familiar with patrol work and, and maps and things. And we got out and we kind of got lost from where we were supposed to go. And we were walking up this railroad track, and here was this city ahead of us, and uh, there was a row of like apartments, about two or three stories high, going down along this road under the railroad station off to the left and in front of us and the trains you could hear them and stuff going. So we go, there was, must have been about six of us, I guess, two jeep loads, I think, about that time when we were going along. And we got on the outskirts right close to the buildings and all of a sudden here comes sheets start coming out. And people who live in these buildings had seen us coming and they were surrendering. They were throwing all their white sheets, sheets out to out. surrender. And then uh, we could see ahead of us there, there was Germans who were apparently on a furlough or something. They had no guns. German soldiers. German soldiers, no guns. And uh, they saw us and they were running around, didn't know where the hell to go or what to do, I guess. Nothing to shoot us with, anything like that. So that's what we finally decided. This was not a place where a six man group could walk in and take a whole city. So we pulled out. And later on, they. <clears throat> gave credit to the division that had come in there and captured them and said, hey, we beat them. I mean, we had them centering to us before the other one did. But it was only six of us. That's right. you, know. <coughs> you were telling me uh, from time to time you'd see our Allied planes going over and oh, the yeah. Germans be firing, shooting at them with the 88s. Yeah, you know, that, was, uh, that was sad. You know, that was like, I was telling you that one time was the worst I've ever seen was when there was a group of about five B-17s going across, and the Germans uh, zeroed in on them. They got them right on the nose, and they knocked all five of them out right, boom, boom, right, right away. And you didn't see pieces even of the plane come down. It was just like tinsel coming down. They apparently had their bomb loads, and the, it uh, explored the whole thing because there wasn't any rudders or wings or anything else. It just disintegrated, you know, up there. And that was a, a sad thing to have to see. Tell me about crossing the Ruhr. Ruhr. Was it the Ruhr for the first? I mean, the, the Rhine. The, the Rhine. Yeah, yeah. The crossing the Rhine. Well, that was, uh, I guess, one of the biggest artillery uh, displays. Well, maybe we should time. maybe we should uh, back up a little bit. Okay, you. Okay. The, the bulge is over. You go down south and clean. Well, the that. bulge wasn't over. Oh, oh well. Oh. But the, the Germans had opened up a new front to try new to bulge. take the pressure off of the, oh, I see. the problems they were having up there. They were starting to run to a lot of resistance, and they tried to spread us out. Uh, and they opened up a new pocket down in the, this Colmore area, which is just north of Switzerland, actually, on the Rhine River. So they pulled us out, our division, and. Uh, the regular division traveled by train, all the, the foot soldiers and companies, but we were jeep mounted, and so anybody had trucks and all that sort of stuff went in a convoy and trucks, and we went over the French Alps, which was a beautiful sight. Now, of course, it's a great place to go from skiing, but 
in those days we, it was colder than hell. <laughs> and uh, so we went down to the Colmar, and then we got involved uh, down there for about a month, I guess, uh, fighting down Similar there. Similar type of fighting as you had. Same type of thing we did, yeah. That, uh, it was, a well, it was quite a variety. It was flat country down different, there. Different terrain. Quite flat. It wasn't really heavy woods like we had uh-huh. up the north. But uh, like I can remember there, we we had a long stretch along the Rhine River. There was trees and the river and the road, and we'd have to patrol all night long, take turns. Jeeps, we'd go down there and relieve each other, and go down trying to catch any Germans infiltrating or coming through that area, so we'd creep along in our jeep, you know, quiet as we could, and uh, one guy had a heck of a time because they had a squeaky brake on their jeep, and <laughs> they'd go down, they'd put the brake on and squeak, and then they'd get shelled like mad, the Germans pick it up, you know, and shell them, and you hate to stop the thing and turn around or whatever and put the brakes on because they could, they would get shelled every time they did, but we did that type of thing there, and then we went out on a number of patrols. There again, it's like, you know, it's the dead would see, you pulled in the Komar the first day, I guess, and there was a German equivalent of our jeep sitting there, you know, and there's a, a, a German soldier laying out the door, his feet hooked up underneath the dashboard, he just laying there dead, you know, in the jeep. And he, some of these things kind of stand out in your mind that you, you see these dead people like that. And the other thing was like, you go into after a battle, see, we'd be out there they'd be checking on the Germans or what we were doing, and they'd be loading the dead Americans on these big six-by-six six trucks, and they'd load them, and they'd, they'd be maybe ten, ten deep, you know, just bodies in there. Then they'd go by, and rigor mortis said, and, you know, they're all going by, their legs are all bouncing, and all these poor guys going by. Then you wonder sometimes, too, like we were, you know, Back in the area, it's both been fairly safe, but uh, next door was a commander of one of the companies there of our group. And I remember a lieutenant came in from the States and reported in, and uh, all of a sudden the German shell came right and hit that building and killed this poor guy. What, what do you say? What, what good did he do to try to help the warfare? He, you know, then he wasn't in combat, he just came in and reported and was killed. It, uh, it's so futile that uh, you don't know what little bit you do, what good it does to the total. When you guys went out on these patrols, like, was there some one of somebody making decisions while you were out there, or did you all kind of were were you all capable of sort of making your own decisions about you know what to do in certain well, situations? Well, we were on our own. Basically, we were told to go. Observe this or do that or find something else. But I mean, let's say in your there, three, in your group of let's say and you were the oldest guy. So did they kind of look yeah. up to you to, if you were getting in trouble or something no, or what? No, anything like that. We all had our job to do, and I don't know if anyone thought of anybody else as being better at what he did than the other one. Um, well, you know, like for example, say we go down through the woods and we found out trading and all that. You could cut a green a green small branch or something, and the, the Germans would put trip wires across t- trails and things like this. Well, that's up to us to realize this is a situation that might happen, and I remember it happened one time. We had a guy in the front going on, you'd run that along, and it's so flexible that it would pick up a trip wire without tripping it. Oh, okay. And so the lead band had, would go along, and we decide on that. And then uh, once we found out there was trip wires there, then we, by watching we could tell we'd step to, to miss these things. Uh, now a trip wire would, would set off a booby trap or? or it had a personnel mine, you know, the ones we hated the most, they called them bouncing Betsy's, I think it was. And they would they'd, they'd come out of the ground about waist high and then explode and <laughs> take your privates out, you know. <laughs> All the GIs were scared to death of those. That type of thing, and hear about it, kidding about it, or whatever. So, uh, but you know, we'd have to work out your own problems as you went because you know, couldn't tell what you were into. A lot of times, depending on the, what the job was going to be or how extensive it was, why our head guy that's going to lead the patrol, he'd go up in an observation plane. 
and he'd look the terrain over and get it in his mind, you know, where everything was. And so that was at nighttime when you were going the long line, he knew what was where, where to go, where I was going to go up here, I'm going to turn, and, and what have you to get to where I got to go. You hear that uh, the American soldiers were better at that doing things on their own than either Germans or Japanese who were regimented and were, we were being that. told what to do. You know, do you think we were taught that, but I don't know, I've known so many Germans and people like that that they were just as smart as I was or any American that I know of. But it was, uh, we were always, well, that's what we always were taught to, that uh, get the communication guy. Like especially the Germans, if they weren't supposed to be able to think on their own. If you got the communication guy, they were sort of left out hanging dry without knowing what to do. But I, I would question a lot of that, although we also were told that, that mm -hmm. in a type of thing. But, uh, so is, is this the area where you crossed the Rhine? This area that, that down by... Oh, no, Comar no, no, we came back up after that. That's what I thought, you went back came up? Came back up into the, the Ardennes. Yeah, up into the, you know, into the industrial area, more Roar. or less, the rural area. And uh, our division was set up where they were going to make the big push. And uh, they had to build up uh, all the equipment. My God, the trucks and the equipment and the supplies they built up to make this big move. And then we had uh, the Coast Guard, which was funny to see them run around, but they they manned the boats oh, yeah. to go across. They had the Coast Guard oh, in there. I know. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so we were to keep the Germans from getting anybody coming in and seeing what was going on. And fortunately, we had air control, so they, they didn't come in and bomb all, all these supplies on that front. And uh, that's why I say, well, I think one of the largest in history as far as the, the bombardment went. It, I say we had the tanks first. And they were right by the dike area where the turrets turned and pointing across the river. How wide was that river? Oh, say see. compared to the Ohio. It was, it was close to, I'd say, the Mississippi. Uh -huh. Something like that where we were. Pretty it wide. It was yeah. fairly wide, yeah. Uh -huh. They had the landing boats. Then they had all these cannons lined up, uh, depending on the size, they back farther and farther. And, and the Germans had similar uh, deployment on the other side? They had tanks and stuff and guns, as far as you know? Or? Well, nothing to compare with what we had. It was, uh, I'm sure they, you know, they had their normal displacement of cannons and stuff, and artillery, and all that. But this thing we had was just monstrous. It was something else. And then after I say, after the bombardment, we, we cut loose and kind of was just obliterated everything out over there. Well, then here along comes the gliders being towed across and uh, I guess the paratroopers were there because hey, we didn't see them, they were back farther. But the gliders, we saw a lot of them going by, being towed in. Uh, yeah. Did you tell where they were being shot at or did you tell from the I never saw any sign now, of that. Now, tell me again, what, what did, well, like what time did the, the bombardment start and what did it, what, what, did, it, what did it feel like or what well, did it, it sound like? It started at, uh, at dawn, just uh, daylight coming up, so and to speak. did you know it was going to happen then? Or? No. We knew it was going to happen sometime, and how close, we didn't how, how close, close were you to the river where you were then? Well, we were back about a mile, I guess, uh, where we were set, uh, in farm country, actually. Now, well, right behind us was the big 10 inches, uh, and uh, see, when this thing went off, I it was unbelievable. I, mean, I even describe it. Our clothes was just flapping from the concussion. And, like in a heavy gale or something, and the buildings, a lot of that tile over there, and tiles were flying all over the place, and it just blew everything apart, just the concussion of all these things when they opened up. It was exciting. You can't match it, I don't think, with uh, just the roar of all those cannons going at one time and stretched along a couple of miles, probably, with, uh, with that. How long did that last? Hmm. I'd say probably better part of an hour they did that. Then the, the sun was up at that time, it was bright and daylight. Uh, and then, uh, which I didn't see him taking off the boats and stuff yeah. crossing. We were back where our, we were located. But uh, When did you cross? 
So they had a pontoon bridge they put up. The engineers are something out of this world. These guys really deserve a lot of credit. And I've seen them under direct artillery fire laying a bridge. You know, if you're one thing, if you can fire back or do something, but these poor guys are out there building pontoon bridges and stuff with the artillery fire on them and everything else. I really think the world of these guys. Just, just have. I was born in Crawfordsville, Indiana. Crawfordsville. And where's Crawfordsville? Um, it's north of Indianapolis. Thirty some, forty some miles, something like that. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, the little town is just darling little town. And my mother and father. And um, my father went to the war. Before, this was before I was born. And, uh, to World was, War One, you mean? One. Oh, is that right? And I, when I was born, then he didn't get to go overseas, and he never forgave me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then they lived there for quite a while. He worked for. Standard Oil, and uh, then he decided to move to California, and so we came out when I was about seven years old, and lived here ever since. Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh, well, I think you have, well, well, yeah, you might just as well come over there, Richard. Be good. Uh, now, your dad, uh, where was he born? I'm imagining Crawfordsville. I'm not sure exactly. I think so. In, in that area. Yeah. My mm -hmm. folks had a, my grandparents had a farm in, outside of Crawfordsville. And so they lived there for quite a, a number of years before they passed away. So my dad worked on the farm before he went to the war. And, uh, what was your, what was your maiden name? Uh, Peyton. P-E-Y-T-O-N, not a P-A-Y. Yeah, that's what my dad says, no P-A-Y. So um, we um, moved to California in, in an old touring car that didn't have any windows. It was all eyes and glass sides. Uh, it was an experience. I loved it. Uh, what know, kind of car was it? What model did you have? Uh, you know? Let's see. What, if I've told you it was a... Uh, And your, your mother, what was her maiden name? Her maiden name was Nelson. Elsie, Elsie May Nelson. <laughs> she was the oldest of uh, 12 children, I think, my grandmother had. And uh, I, when I was born, and I had two uh, aunts and an aunt and an uncle that were year, younger than me, because my mother was married so young. So uh, they were one was six months younger, and the other was about two, two and a half years younger than me. So it's hard to understand that your mother could be, uh, her sister could be younger than her daughter. You know, it's strange. <laughs> what, did, what kind of work did your dad do? Well, he worked all kinds of stuff out here. He worked for um, anything he could get, because that was during the Depression. Jewel tea. tea oh, and, uh, then he got on the police force. Los Angeles, so he, that was what he ended up doing, and he retired from that, that their trailer, and they traveled the country for quite a bit. He, after my mother passed away, he married another lady, and uh, they traveled all over, so it was a, a good life for him. And how did you like coming to California when you were seven, you say? Mm -hmm. Did well, you I did you hate to leave? Well, Diane left Virginia at six when she came to California and just hated it. But, well, she, the kids made fun of her because of her southern accent and yeah, stuff like that in yeah. school. So she had a hard time at first. Well, did Chris, you have any trouble? They gave me fits because my name was Beverly. Oh, Beverly Hills. Beverly right. Hills. Oh, Beverly Boulevard. Beverly Hills, all this kind of <laughs> stuff. But anyway, you know, I, because I, you know, went to young. I missed my aunts and uncles because I had so many, and they treated me. I was the first grandchild, and so I, they treated me like I was the queen of the bee. So. But it's, uh, well, I like California. I love the weather. And so that part of us was, was, you know, fine. And then my, my brother was uh, six years younger than me, and then I had a, a sister that was nine years younger than me. 
Okay, so uh, but, but first it was hard because my father didn't have steady work, you know, and so it was. Uh, this was still depression time yeah, that depression. they were going through. But you guys lived, your families lived sort of in the same neighborhood. After a while, we we moved uh, uh, to West LA. My father, we we lived in like what would you say? South, 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 south